today. It's titled Pulmonary Vascular Diseases, other name is venous thromboembolism, which abbreviated by VTE. Devious thrombosis, DVT, and pulmonary embolism, PE, can be considered under this heading. About 80% of pulmonary embolism arise from the propagation of the lower limb DVT. So the main cause of pulmonary embolization is the deep venous thrombosis of the lower limbs, mainly. Other root causes include septic omuli, which arises from the endocarditis, affecting the tricast or pulmonary valves, especially in those home drug addicts, tumors, especially choriocarcinoma, fat embolization, air embolism, amniotic fluid embolization, and blood center piece embolization. So, the incidence of VTE or pulmonary embolization and DV DVT in the community is unknown. One percent of all patients admitted to the intensive care units. What are the risk factors for venous thromboembolism? First risk factor is surgery. So, what are the operations might lead to the risk factors for venous thromboembolism. First, major abdominal surgery and pelvic surgery, hip and knee surgery, post-operative intensive care patients. Second risk factors is obstetrics disease or conditions. Example, pregnancy and perperium. Other risk factors, cardiorespiratory disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, congestive cardiac failure, other discipline disease. Other risk factors, lower limbs problems, example fractures, varicose veins, stroke, and spinal cord surgery. Many diseases also play a, a risk factors for venous thrombo, thrombotic disease, example abdominal and pelvic pregnant diseases, advanced and metastatic tumors, concurrent chemotherapy for those patients suffering from malignancy. The last risk factors, which are called miscellaneous risk factors, including increasing age, previous or proven venous thromboembolic disease, immobility, thrombotic disorders, and trauma. What about clinical features of venous thrombotic disease? Venous thromboembolic disease can be difficult to diagnose. It may be helpful to consider the following. So, how to help ask ourselves the following questions. First question Is the clinical presentation consistent with pulmonary embolism? Does the patient have risk factors for pulmonary embolism? Are there any alternative diagnosis or differential diagnosis that can explain the patient presentation? So, the presentation varies depending on the number, size, and distribution of emboli, and the underlying cardiorespiratory reserve. A recognized risk factor is present between 80% and 90% of patients, as mentioned in the previous slide. The presence of one or more risk factors may multiply the risk for venous thromboembolic disease. So, pulmonary classified into three types regarding the clinical features. First type is acute massive pulmonary What about pathophysiology of acute massive pulmonary There is major hemodynamic effects, or there are major hemodynamic effects, including decreased cardiac output, acute right side heart failure, what about symptoms of acute massive pulmonary embolization? Faintness or collapse, crushing central chest pain, apprehensions, I mean fear of death, severe dyspnea. What about clinical signs? Major circulatory collapse, including tachycardia, hypotension, raised JVB, right ventricular galloping, loud second heart sound, especially. P2, pulmonary components, severe cyanosis, decreased urinal output. 
Chest X-ray usually normal and maybe subtle origin. ECG finding including what is called S1, Q3, T3 pattern, anterior T wave inversion, right bundle branch blocks. This picture shows the what is called S1 in the lead one, Q3 in the lead three, T3, T inversion in the lead three. Also can be present with uh, other changes, uh, right bundle branch block, deep S in the V1 lead one, and long R in the V1. These are the ECG changes in the acute massive pulmonary embolism. Markedly abnormal decrease in the partial oxygen tension, PiO2, and decrease in the CO2, BiCO2. Patient might present with metabolic acidosis in severe cases of massive pulmonary embolization. Differential diagnosis have to have put in your mind myocardial infarction. <coughs> pericardial tongue and aortic dissections. All of these three cases can be mimic acute massive permobilization in the presentation. Second type of permobilization it is called acute small to medium permobilization. Pathophysiologically, there is occlusion of segmental pulmonary artery which is due to the infarction plus minus effusion. Symptom patient was in pleuritic chest pain, restricted breathing, hemoptysis. Signs, tachycardia, pleural rub, raised hemodiaphragm, crackles, effusion of blood stains with low-grade fever sometime. Radiologically, there is pleuropulmonary opacities, patient might go through pleural effusion, linear shadows, and raised hemodiaphragm. You see changes, patient might develops what is called sinus tachycardia. Arterial blood gas may be normal or decrease BiO2 or decrease BiCO2. The function diagnosis of the acute small or medium pulmonary embolization pneumonia, which might present with a pleuritic chest pain, pneumothorax again might present with pleuritic chest pain, musculoskeletal chest pain, also the patient might present only with chest pain. The third type of pulmonary embolization clinically is called the chronic pulmonary embolism. But physiologically, chronic pulmonary embolism due to the chronic occlusion of pulmonary microvasculatures, right heart failure. This is uh, uh, one of the underlying pathophysiology of chronic pulmonary embolization. Patient might present with exertion of this knee, left symptom of pulmonary hypertension or right heart failure. Clinical signs may be minimal early in the disease, later by ventricular heat, loud B2, terminal signs of right side heart failure. X-ray, a large pulmonary arterial trunks, a large heart prominent right ventricle. ECG changes, mainly right ventricular hypertrophy and right ventricular strain. Arterial blood gases, exertion of decrease in the PIO2 or desaturations of on formal exercise tenses. What about the differential diagnosis of chronic position and uh, other causes of pulmonary hypertension? How investigate patients with pulmonary embolism or venothrombotic diseases? The first investigation is chest radiography. The chest radiography is useful for excluding the differential diagnosis of pulmonary embolization, as I mentioned, uh, like pneumonia or pneumothorax. So, normal appearance in an acutely dyspneic and hypoxemic patient should raise the suspicion of pulmonary embolization, as should bilateral changes in a patient presenting with unilateral ability chest pain. So, the common radiological, or the common <coughs> radiological presentation of pulmonary thromboembolism or infarction include either oligemia of the lung fields, a large pulmonary artery, elevation of the hemidiaphragm, pulmonary opacities, wedge-shaped opacity due to the pulmonary infarction, horizontal linear opacities, a pleural effusion. All these are features of pulmonary thromboembolism and on function on chest, chest x-ray. Other investigations, ECG, 
The ECG is often normal, but it's used for excluding other important differential diagnoses such as acute malfunction and pericarditis, as mentioned in the previous slide five. Arterial blood gases <coughs> typically show a reduced PiO2, a normal or low PiCO2, but may be normal in a significant minority. A metabolic acidosis may be seen in acute massive with cardiovascular collapse. D-dimer and other circulatory markers. A D-dimer has specific degradations, products released into the circulation when costing fibrin undergoes an endogenous fibrinolysis. An elevated D-dimer is of limited value as it can uh, have been or can increase in a number of conditions, including pulmonary embolism, myocardial function, pneumonia, and sepsis. So, low D-dimer levels less than five nanogram per month measured by analysis particularly where clinical risk is low, have a high negative predictive value and further investigation is unnecessary. This is algorithm show the investigation of patient with suspected pulmonary embolism, various thromboembolism suspected, assess clinical risk and measure the dimer level. When the dimer level negative and the risk is low, no DVT or pulmonary embolism. When the D-dimer is positive with high risk, it treat as pulmonary embolism. When the D-dimer is positive with, risk, with low risk, have to have do ultrasound, leg veins, CT pulmonary geography, ventilation, perfusion. Uh, <coughs> uh, and when the D-dimer is negative and the risk is high, then have to proceed to the ultrasound of the legs, veins, plus minus CT pulmonary and geography. Thank you.